Hello, everyone, and welcome to this very special webcast presentation of IDG's 2021 State of the CIO survey results. The CIO Executive Council has collaborated with IDG on a number of these presentations over the years to offer an in-depth view at some of the findings of the annual surveys. These are all based on responses from top IT leaders and line of business executives. My name is Tim Scannell, and I am Director of Strategic Content at the Council. This is the 20th year IGG has conducted this influential research that provides a qualitative glimpse at what IT leaders are planning in terms of budgets, technology initiatives, spending, and talent engagement and recruitment, just to name a few topic areas. In all, 1,062 executives responded to the survey, more than 800 of whom are directly involved in IT. This is about a 15% increase over last year's responses. This, I think, is an indication of how eager executives in the IT community are to share information as we come out of the grips of the COVID pandemic and enter a period focusing on recovery and resiliency. It is a pivotal time for the IT industry and companies in general worldwide. For the first time in this year's survey, we also ask questions related to diversity and inclusion within the IT organization, a topic we will touch upon during our discussion today. Joining us to provide qualitative insights from the IT front are two experienced technology executives, Sarah Nakvi, Executive Vice President and CIO at HMS Host, a leading provider of food and beverage services located at airports and other travel venues around the world, and Nathan Rogers, Senior Vice President and CIO for SAIC, a Fortune 500 technology integrator that provides solutions to the defense, space, civilian, and intelligence markets. Thank you both for taking part in the discussion today. For having us. Thank you. I'd like to remind everyone in the audience that the session is purposely designed to be interactive, and we invite you to take part by sending your questions and comments via CIO.com's LinkedIn or Twitter pages. We'll be monitoring the flow, and we'll do our best to present as many as we can. Taking us through the survey results and moderating the discussion today is my good friend and colleague, John Gallant who is the Enterprise Consulting Director at IDG, and before that, Chief Content Officer at IDG US Media. Welcome, John. Hey, Tim, how are you? Very well, thank you. I think you'll agree that this past year has been challenging for most companies and IT organizations, to say the least, and that 2021 and future years will be both demanding and exciting in terms of opportunities. Tim, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, as, as you mentioned, uh, we're gonna be going through the state of the CIO research results today, but I've also been working with IDG this year on research that we've done about the role of um, the pandemic and how it's changed, uh, changed everything from how workers are supported in the organization to the priorities of digital transformation, automation, security, all of those kinds of issues. And I think this survey today gives us a good look at that, as well as some of the issues about how uh, it's changing the role of the, of the CIO. So we'll look at this today in four parts. Again, some of the impact of the pandemic, current status of the CIO role, and then we'll look at how that role is expanding and what some of the priorities that respondents told us for 2021 and beyond. And then we'll look also at some of the business and tech initiatives, including uh, diversity and inclusion, as you mentioned early on. It's an absolute pleasure for me to be joined by Sarah and Nathan, and I'll be sharing some of the research results and then asking them to weigh in on what they found interesting, how this matches with what they're experiencing within their organizations and their thoughts on what's ahead. So I'm really looking forward to hearing from them and hearing from all of you as well. As Tim said, we wanna make this interactive and engaging. So um, again, let's start by looking quickly at the pandemic and the new tech landscape. I wanna show three slides that capture some of the high level impacts from a budget perspective and then in terms of new initiatives. I also want to reiterate that this is just a slice of the overall state of the CIO survey. There are many more slides uh, that you can take a look at. We've provided a link from that uh, so that you can access the full survey. A lot of work goes into this each year. It has a lot of history behind it as well. So we can see some trends as well as some, uh, some new areas. One of the things that we asked folks was what happened to your 2020 IT budget as a result of the pandemic? 
and you can see that it's pretty much a split. It's almost a, a three-way split here, um, divided into thirds roughly. There's a third of the folks who increased their IT budget. And I think, you know, I've talked to a number of CIOs who really emphasize the fact that coming out of this challenging situation, they want to put their company in the strongest possible position. Many cited having learned from the 2008 Great Recession that if you only cut costs, you don't come out of these challenging situations as strongly as companies that continue to invest while at the same time optimizing their expenses. About a third of the folks made no changes to their budget and about 30% of enterprise size companies, and that's companies we would say are a thousand plus in employees, uh, actually saw a budget cut. Now, I want to show how this has changed. This is kind of a busy chart, but it, to, re, to emphasize that we've been talking with CIOs for a long time about these trends and what they're doing with their budgets. We have the um, a survey that we do every year, the CIO tech poll, that we ask them about what's going to come, what's coming in the, in the year ahead. And we're comparing some of our new data with what's happened all the way back. Actually, this data extends well beyond uh, 2008. But I want to point out here in uh, December 2019, when we did this survey, the blue line, what 60% of CIOs said at that point, they were going to increase their budgets for 2020. And only about 7% said they were going to cut them. About 34% said they were going to stay the same. Well, look at what happened in April 2020 when we did our first COVID research study. That number of companies that were going to cut budgets jumped up to 35%. And the number who said they were going to increase them went down to 25%. And you can see when we did this survey in December of 2020, things have stabilized again. That was the slide I showed you earlier. 49% now tell us that for the year ahead, they're going to increase their budget. 39% say their budget will stay the same as 2020. And only 12% say that their budgets will be lower than in 2020. So you can see that things have stabilized. And in fact, there's a, even a sense of more confidence there going forward. We also asked people whether they agreed with the following statement. You know, did you implement new technologies, new IT strategies, or new methodologies due to the pandemic? Vast majority of people agreed with that statement. CIOs are doing new things. They've implemented new technologies, new approaches as a result of the pandemic. And here's where I really wanted to call in Sarah and uh, Sarah and Nathan. Nathan, let me start with you. Was there anything that we saw in the budget data? that struck you as interesting? How does it, how does that jibe with your own experiences? Yeah, sure. No, we definitely experienced that V curve there where, you know, we're, we're spending, you know, we're flat or up going into the 2020 and then with uh, the pandemic and everyone going home for us, it was March 13th. We all went home. I remember flying home that day um, and we kind of froze everything really short term, just said, okay, hold on. Let's just take, see what's going on. Right. And once we came out of it, we said, you know what, we, we've actually got to invest in technology. So, so again, you can sign up, you see that curve on the prior slide going up. And, and here you see the results of a lot of other CIOs, I think, experiencing the same thing. For us, we had been really focused in 2019. We had stood up a team with HR facilities and IT to talk about the workplace of the future. So, you know, it was kind of slowly going along. Then comes the pandemic and all of a sudden it's much more than, you know, the workplace of the future. It's really the work of the future. And that team has become a really uh, mature team. Um, I, I was talking before the call, we just had an all hands and we presented some of what we're working on for the future of work for, for SAIC. And the first time as a CEO for me, where I actually had digital investment dollars during the year, during a pandemic given to, to me for my budget, not to do anything new per se, but to take our roadmap and go faster. You know, all the things we were planning, they're like, we gotta go faster with this stuff. Um, and it was really exciting um, as we've been kind of uh, moving through this year and seeing it mature. That's great. Sarah, how about you? Does this map with your experience? 
Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and first of all, thank you for having me. Um, I'd like to echo what Nathan was saying. We've seen a significant shift, not only just on a focus of technology, but just the appetite and, and a realization and recognition about how important technology is. Uh, we are, uh, you know, I get very few questions when I'm talking about technology and, and how it's going to influence the business transformation that we are seeing. We've gone from, um, you know, being all on site uh, to really quickly shifting into an environment that's totally remote. Uh, the, the adoption of new technologies such as collaboration tools, the Microsoft Teams, and how quickly users have not only adapted to that, but have really appreciated having you know, such avenues through which they could engage with the business, um, which has, as a result, um, you know, increased uh, collaboration, better collaboration with IT, uh, not only just with the appreciation, but also investment in budget. I'd like to echo what um, Nathan said. I, we, need, we can't do things fast enough uh, is is the uh, theme um, that that I'm faced with. Uh, I also represent uh, the retail industry and food and beverage industry. So for that, for us, it was not only just transforming the workforce internally, but to make that investment to really meet the demands of the consumers. Uh, so if somebody's coming and dining with us, they're not um, you know really necessarily uh, comfortable. Yeah. picking up a menu. So deploying contactless technologies and deploying all of these at a very fast pace has been the demand and, and actually exciting because we've gone from a push to a pull environment for technologies, which is pretty exciting. That's great. So I, I wanted to ask you, you know, we, this, this slide talks about new things that people have implemented. What have you done differently? What's, what's a change in strategy, methodology, technology footprint that you think will will continue, that it's not just a reflection of the moment, but will continue moving forward. Sarah, what have you, what's kind of a lasting change as a result of this? Yeah, I, I just think that the entire environment has changed. Uh, as, as I said earlier, it's how technology is looked at. Um, as far as specifically looking at our approach and strategies, we found ourselves to be a little bit uh, more open to trial and error than we've been in the past. Uh, you know, customers had very low appetite of uh, any type of failures. They wanted things per perfect before it went into production. Uh, but in light of COVID, it has kind of shifted the culture uh, where we are now able to to be a little bit more open to trying new things. So that's that's definitely a pretty a decent shift. Um, in addition to that, it has also forced me to take a look at um, the partners that we collaborate with. You know, what is their appetite to really yeah. lift and shift very quickly um, in response to the changing business environment? So that has allowed me to take a step back and really weigh in as to which are the players that I want to continue in my portfolio and who are going to be stronger players as a part of the strategy. Um, so it's, it's, it's a wake up call for sure from all aspects, engagement with the business, engagement with the players and overall technology investments that can scale and adapt to a very rapid change. And I think that, la that point about your partners is a really important one and, and hoping that they understand the changing expectations and the changing uh, strategies going forward. Nathan, what kind of permanent or, or semi-permanent yeah. changes do you see coming? Yeah, I mean, I totally agree with the cultural stuff. I'll, I mean, I'll go to the technology side and, and make it really simple. Zoom, um, you know, or Teams. I mean, how many people have, you, this is just part of their life now. Um, and it's so ingrained, you know, it's kind of like when you got your first smartphone, now you don't know what you do without it. I think we're going to see that with the collaboration tools as well. And they're going to get more and more advanced. But, you know, at work, at schools, you know, anywhere with friends across the country, I think it's really going to be part of our culture um, and, and the technology that allows us to collaborate much more so than I, I believe any of us were experiencing fully before. Um, so, you know, going to go really simple there, but just the Zoom, you know, feeling is, is totally going to stick around. <laughs> yeah, so. exactly. I agree with you. Uh, sore neck and everything that comes yeah. with all, all of these video calls. So we want to spend some time looking at the, the status of the CIO. And every year we ask folks, you know, do you, we don't ask them to choose whether they're transformational, strategic, or functional. We ask them basically where they're spending their time, where, where their, their energy really focused. And then we align that with these definitions. So uh, obviously, I think if you asked everybody to select, you, you, I would select superstar for myself. But we ask people, where are you spending your time? And then how does that really uh, define you as a CIO leader? So the functional leader is really focused on operations, focused on our internal 
delivering internal business value, sort of that traditional older role of the CIO. Transformation leaders are really working more with their business counterparts, uh, focusing on an enterprise-wide perspective, really being strong collaborators. And business strategists are those who are really focused beyond the borders of the business, looking at um, creating ecosystems, looking at creating the next level of products and services that a company offers. So this is where people are viewing themselves today. If we look at 2020 and 2021, if they, based on their responses, this is how the group breaks down, pretty much a split more people in the strategic and transformational camp. But when we ask people where they want to be in three years, clearly we see that the bulk of folks want to be in that strategic role, business strategist role. So I wonder, um, Nathan and Sarah, is there anything in this slide that surprises you? And, and how does it kind of match up with the evolution of your own roles? Chad, you want to, John? Sure, Nathan, why don't you start? Yeah. Um, so, you know, what I think is interesting, I know I've been through, you know, talk, I've heard IT leaders talk for a long time about becoming more strategic, having a seat at the table. You know, I think we're starting to see that that perception of the, of ourselves is here, where, where we're seeing the increase and we see the increase in the future. What will be interesting, and I know we, we as we go through the survey, we'll see other results, is is that actually what's happening? And, and how do our, our peers or other executives um, in our organizations see us? Um, and I think it's really trying to, to, you know, make this idea of being more strate strategic real for ourselves, but also within our organizations too, that, that is the challenge. But this is, you know, good direction. Great. Sarah, what's your thinking on this? Yeah, I mean, uh, John, I would say that this transformation, this change, this shift in the role of IT began way before COVID, you know, as, as soon as digital transformation came in and how technology became more and more embedded in our business. Uh, the role of CIO was expected to change. We all like to believe that we are all very transformational and strategic in, uh, in our operations. I, I do believe that um, there is a third category here where it's a hybrid of transformational and functional. You cannot be a transformation um, engine if you don't understand the functional side of it and the challenges that you face in running of the business. So um, there, that transformation, that change, the shift in the role had, had began way before COVID and will continue to evolve and has become even more important. I can speak for my industry and for my role personally, as soon as uh, digital began to become more and more relevant, um, so did my role from, uh, you know, working for a CFO and now reporting to the CEO for the very reason that um, the need for technology to not only be uh, an executor of the tech, ex executor of the strategy, but actually be a creator, a voice in creating the strategy became important. So this does not surprise me at all. Uh, and if, if a CIO does not change and get connected with the business, then they're no longer going to stay relevant. It is a need. It is imperative for their success. Makes sense. Tim, did you, we have a question, I understand. Yeah, actually, we have a couple of questions from the audience. The first one is directed at Sarah. Uh, you know, earlier she said that there's more leeway for trial and error in her organization. But the audience member is wondering, is it more pragmatic, though? Or, you know, you know, obviously, as digital transformation is accelerated and moving much faster, is there more, uh, uh, you know, caution in making those decisions going forward? Um, I, I think there is this fine balance. When you think about digital and innovation uh, by nature, that you're seeing a lot of that, at least in my industry, coming in from smaller players that might not have all of the processes and everything baked to the extent that we would be typically used to. Um, so striking a good balance between security and safety and still being open to try. I mean, one of the idea that we are playing with is how do we create a field pilot which really addresses all of the security needs and really isolate it from the rest of the business that gives us a good playground to test out new players without really compromising the rest of our business. So those are the type of ideas that we are playing, playing with as a result of trying to strike a balance between being a little bit more risk takers yet mitigating it uh, with creating controls around and striking a balance. Thank you. And one further question. This is one is directed at Nathan, I believe. Um, back in the days of your pre-COVID, uh, most every company had mobile management uh, rules and structures in place. Now, most everyone is working at home or was working at home in 20 and a big percentage will be working from home going forward. Nathan, is there a playbook for this? Are there rules in place at SAIC in terms of, you know, uh, technology and what, what is uh, 
uh, what is ex- what is given out to people in, in terms of the home offices? Yeah, no, we we um, we do embrace the ability to work from anywhere um, on any device, but we have a lot of security around that. So we're certainly moving towards a zero trust environment. But um, as a government contractor, we follow what's called NIST 800 171, so the NIST standards. I um, mean, there's also new CMMC standards too that you'll you'll probably hear about. Um, in the news and, and with the government. So we do follow those and um, that allows us to have a very secure environment uh, regardless of where you work. I mean, it's definitely, you know, you're, it's not like um, your personal life. You don't have the, all the freedoms that you have in your personal life for sure. Um, there's a lot of uh, rules and regulations, but I'm working out of my house today as the CIO and, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're keeping our environment pretty secure. So we were able to do that day one um, because we have always had a very geographically dispersed population. Over 60% of our employees sit at customer sites um, and they use customer computers. They use their personal computers to come in, um, you know, virtually. So we've always had a uh, environment. So when the when we had to go home, it it wasn't too bad. We, We were used to that environment. If I may just um, add to that, the one impact that we are seeing because of the shift of resources, you know, remotely um, is as we are looking at our cyber insurance and all the the need for security, the need for compliance and really mm-hmm. exercising and demonstrating that you're in a fully secure environment, no matter where you are, has become very important, especially for those uh, those companies that are renegotiating the cyber um, insurances, because you're seeing a lot more content around how are you ensuring um, security um, as a result of uh, distribution of workforce. And, and that and there's a question that just came in about cybersecurity in terms of that. Uh, so are your cybersecurity efforts more on building awareness among those, those workers right now because they're at home and there's a lot more happening around them? Or is it applying tools that they can apply to their own technology? Actually, both. Because just really doing, um, you know, acceptable use training and procedures and policies, educating them and doing multiple cycles rather than one or two that we used to do. We are doing, you know, campaigning on what to look for, for, you know, for instance, uh, ransomware and all of these other intrusions that we've seen in the past. Um, it's it, uh, increasing awareness and then putting in controls around it to uh, monitor a lot more closely than we've ever done before. John, I, I know you're the moderator. I was going to say, if you flip to the next slide, um, the cybersecurity question um, kind of pops up there at the top. <laughs> so, you know, in a, so from a security management standpoint, and to touch back to people being more strategical, I, I believe, you know, as CIOs, you know, working with your CISO um, or CISOs on the phone as well, you know, cyber hygiene's always been table stakes, but you have got to be part of your company's cybersecurity strategy and building out that roadmap. Cybersecurity, I think, for organizations in the future is really a differentiator. You've got to, you've got to nail it and, and be amazing at it. And there's a lot of companies that we've seen over the last year, right, that have had trouble. Um, clearly, solar winds recently, um, but we'll see more of that too. So I think it's really important, and it's hard because it's expensive and invisible to a certain degree. And putting MFA on your employees is not fun. Um, so it creates a lot of rules. So you're going to get a lot of pushback from the company. So it's really, you have to be strategical. You have to convince the executive team. You have, the board of directors is very much paying attention to this, convince them, get the right funding and, and secure the environment. There's nothing easy about it. So I, I consider this one of, um, you know, the, one of the top, you know, you have 10 things you're working on. It's one of the top 10 uh, strategy things you need to work on. And I think we see it here in this chart that this is what people are thinking about. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Nathan, that's a great segue because this we asked people and I'll show you this in another slide. We asked people to uh, CIOs to best characterize their current focus and how they're spending their time. And this is what we got back. To me, what's interesting about this is this real mix of both operational uh, and semi urgent issues, along with really business oriented issues. So if you look at things like security management at the top of the list, improving IT operations and systems performance, implementing new systems and architecture, you know, three of the top four. Uh, But then we have aligning IT with business goals, driving business innovation, cultivating the IT business partnership. So again, a real mix of operational and strategic. And then when we ask uh, attendees, I'm sorry, (laughs) I've been doing too many events. When we ask CIOs in the research, which of the following activities do you plan to spend more time on in the next three years? This is how the mix changes. And we can see that it, it that more of the business-oriented goals 
come to the top. Implementing new systems and architecture, still there. I think that's a change that's been accelerated by the pandemic. Uh, you know, as um, Sarah has talked about, the pandemic is an accelerator of big changes that were already underway. But how do these, you, you know, Sarah, how do these priorities line up with what you're working on? Or is there anything in here that really struck you as odd? Um, no, this is pretty um, aligned with what I am seeing, not only just within our organization, but industry in general. I, I, I do think that the reason why um, security is not uh, further up or, or available, because it's a given. I mean, I think the expectation is that um, it's not something that we can be complacent with. It cannot be out of sight, out of mind. Uh, and with any of these initiatives, the expectation is that security is a part of that decision-making process. So um, I'm, um, you know, this does not surprise me at all. A couple other things that I was um, looking at was, um, although the percentages aren't as high comparatively, uh, but as we look at business innovation, it's also doing um, a lot of like transformation, automation, redesigning of the business processes, which there's a smaller percentage here. Um, and then um, the 25% that's noted midway, which says cultivating the IT business partnership, again, a significant shift. And I expect this to become uh, a little bit more, uh, perhaps move higher in the list because the boundaries between IT and the business are becoming very gray as well. Uh, as far as I, I'm concerned, I, I see everybody being a technology leader, making it you know harder for us to stay ahead of the curve. Um, so that was, again, another thing that was interesting to me is how this is becoming a topic of discussion, which it hasn't been in the past before. So I'm interested in getting your view on this, both Nathan and Sarah, and I'll start with you, Nathan. Obviously, an awful lot of change going on right now. There are all the changes that, that your team is focused on in helping the business to deal with the current situation and prepare for business going forward, but also take big changes going on within technology with cloud and security issues. And all. How are you as a CIO balancing these, you know, the, the strategic part and the, you know, the ongoing operational part? So, I mean, I think you know, as a, as a leader, you need to have focus on those leadership skills and, and, and really those soft skills um, and have the right team. I mean, I have a very strong team that's able to run the day-to-day -day business. You know, I have strategical people that are able to think about strategy. I have a good CDO, a good CISO. You know, I've got the right people that can help me so that, you know, Yes, I'm focused on strategy, but I'm also focused on leadership and leading um, the team to, uh, to do the right stuff so that I can focus also on, on strategies for the company beyond really IT. So, you know, we do a lot of M&A activity. I'm very involved with that. Um, yeah. Looking at new uh, business works, you know, business, uh, business areas to, to pursue. So I think you got to, to me, it, it, at some point, you, it, the leadership part is a huge part of your job. And I'm very into org health and being making sure your organization is a top performing team. So that's how I'm able to balance it um, with, with the day-to-day -day versus the strategy. And Nathan, just before I let you off the hook there, as a result of what happened over the past year, have you made any changes in, your, in, your, in the structure of your team to emphasize new skills or new, uh, or new initiatives? I have. We, we um, and I know a lot of other companies are already well down this road, but we were not. Um, so we have um, started, you know, using agile processes, DevSecOps processes. I mean, things I know a lot of companies have been doing for a long time, but we were not. So we really took that on this year because um, we realized we needed to move faster. And as Sarah said earlier, you know, you, it failed quick um, as well. So we, we definitely took that on and, and we are full blown, you know, getting that team organized. And you know, there's been um, new members of our team we brought in that were real practitioners in that area, too, that could help the team uh, because, you know, we've got a lot of great uh, team members, but some of them hadn't lived it. So we brought some people in from the outside to help as well. And it's going really well. Sarah, can you talk to me about how you're striking that balance, you and your team, between, you know, all of the change and technology issues that need to be dealt with, the acceleration of these changes? and the strategic focus. Yeah, our, our uh, journey of really transforming IT started about a year ago, right before you know COVID hit us. So we were well positioned. Um, what we did was um, 
started taking a look at the demand that was coming very rapidly due to digital implementations. And we just didn't have the bandwidth or the capacity, nor uh, you know, would we ever have enough money to do everything that we needed to do. So we had to optimize our IT performance and we need to really figure out not only how to restructure, uh, but create more funding to allocate towards digital. So we ended up outsourcing IT. That was, uh, it's, it's funny that I signed the agreement February of uh, 2020, right before COVID hit. So. Uh, wow. We just made it right under the uh, under the wire, and uh, by far, you know, looking back, I, I think that was the best decision that I made. Um, to otherwise, I wouldn't have been able to really respond to the demand that was coming. Um, through outsourcing, I split the organization into two parts. The running part of the business, the functional, you know, dealing with the day-to-day -day operations became an outsource function. And I scaled down and created a very focused team, which was going to drive, uh, you know, all of the new initiatives for the business that were creating more value. Um, and so I was able to like really secure the talent that I needed, whether it was on cloud or digital or any of the, you know, uh, RPAs, uh, robotics, and all of those um, um, skills that were so badly needed. Um, so now I have a very internally dedicated team that's very close to the business, understands the business, very rapid and really trying out new things. Um, while I have the day-to-day, -day, the running of the business, uh, you know, being done by a third-party uh, provider. So that, that has worked well for us. Um, and because um, we had taken that step of outsourcing, I was able to reduce the cost of running of the IT by 30%, which thereby helped me contribute, uh, you know, those funds towards transformation. So that's all great. in all, it has been like a fantastic uh, thing. Uh, the, the other advantage that, you know, very quickly with this outsourced solution that I've been able to build in as a part of our agreement was have the ability to tap into the talent from around the world uh, yeah. to really secure talent for innovation, because you can never have enough internal resources to deal with the rapid pace at which technology is changing. So with this outsourcing agreement, now I have, you know, um, access to talent that we, which I didn't have in the past. And we're going to talk about talent and skills that are in demand and hard to get. So that's a great point. Thanks for teeing that up. Tim, I think you have a question. Uh, yeah, a question from one of the attendees, sort of zeroing in the comments that Nathan made about uh, working with the team and, and the business side. Uh, the attendee was wondering if the, if the LOBs, the line of business people, uh, we're really up to speed on agile methodology and the importance of most viable production of products, or did, or did you have to do some sort of a training? <coughs> so for, for our company, they are, um, so let me say it two ways. The lines of business that are customer facing are aware of it because we're an IT company, engineering company. So many of them are very familiar with the agile journey and, and what it is. Our functional groups, we are absolutely training them. So, you know, our contracts, our finance, you know, HR, um, we've been doing sessions and bringing them along and, and what their role is now as part of that team, that subject matter expert. So internally, absolutely, a lot of education has been needed because we've been doing things the same way for a very long time. And, and people have been here a long time, which is great. Um, but, but we had to bring in some new ideas and get those teams. But people have been really excited about it because they control their pipeline. They understand what's being done. Um, I mean, people are really excited about it from a functional perspective. But in terms of our lines of business, the, the vast majority of employees, you know, they, they understand Agile um, because that's, you know, what we do for our customers. Um, so, so that wasn't a hard part. Sarah, what about you? Did you have to spend some time on digital literacy and operational literacy? Um, yes, I, I just think where we needed to educate the customers the most was uh, how and why they couldn't get everything yesterday. <laughs> So the speed of delivery was uh, something that we just needed to set some expectations. So, uh, you know, agile processes, the minute that you educate them on that, the expectation is I'm going to ask for it and I'm going to get it right away. Um, so, so that was, uh, for me, by far the, the biggest hurdle that we had to overcome. Great. Okay, thank you. So I want to talk about some of the expansion, continuing on this theme of expanding the role of the CIO and, the, and new areas of focus. We asked CIOs, which of these actions or activities changed in importance over the last six to 12 months? And you can see the breakdown in the darker blue is the increased in importance. No change is the brighter blue and kind of that gray color is decreased in importance. And these are ranked by, <clears throat> there are many other selections, but these are the ranked by the ones that grew in importance the most. And again, it's this interesting mix of both business and operational focus. 
T topping the list, automating business or IT processes. I have heard this in every conversation with CIOs and, and IT teams. What I love on here is this interacting directly with customers. I, in, in order to innovate, in order to create new products and services, in order to better support sales teams and other teams out in the field, interacting directly with customers is so important, along with developing the customer journey and understanding that and the role of customer experience in the success of the company. So I want to talk with, um, with Nathan and Sarah about that. I also want to point out we will be talking about diversity and inclusion coming up in a couple of these other topics. But Sarah, let's start with you in terms of this interacting with customers. Can you talk about what you and your team do in order to really get into the head of the customers and how that's changing for you and in, in your role? Yeah, the, this um, certainly took um, a hit when we were faced with COVID. You know, yeah. customers uh, were inundated with the demand of keeping the workforce safe, especially when you are in food and beverage industry. It's, you know, PPE compliance, tracking of, you know, COVID cases, all of these other things. Um, so what we found that they were, they were completely overwhelmed and not having the education or, or uh, the background to really see how technology can really ease that burden. Uh, it it presents and opened the door for us where we could interact directly with the with the customers and understand where they were spending most of their time and really give them technology solutions um, to uh, make things easier, which uh, in the absence of that partnership and relationship, we would not have been able to do so. Um, the, the other thing that um, is over here uh, that jumps out at me is influencing the customer journey. Again, another idea as to as we start educating as CIOs get closer to the business and they understand where the business uh, is having the most heartache or where they're spending most of the time, they may not, it may not be just easily apparent that technology again could be an influencer. So you cannot transform the business without having those partnerships and without understanding where the pain points are. Um, another opportunity, another area for us to engage better with the customers. You know, we've been able to track the entire life stream. I mean, the other challenges that we had, for instance, so, you know, we work in airports, uh, airlines um, and plane mints were very unpredictable. So how do you open and close the store? How do you staff people quickly? How do you shift resources? All of these challenges, the more we understood, the more we were able to bring uh, technology solutions to enable this shift um, in, in the new way of operating uh, within, the, uh, within our space. So Thank you. That's great. Nathan, I want to get your take. When we think of customers, I think we always tend to think of, you know, an individual at a retail outlet or a customer at a restaurant or someone buying online, but you're a B2B or B2, B2G business to government uh, organization. What does this mean for you in terms of interacting with your customers uh, and, and things like customer journey? Yeah. And I'll take it. I'll take it one other step too. When I think of customers, we, you know, not only, do we think of external, but we also think of internal because we certainly do a lot of, you know, R and D. So we'll support the the business, you know, the, the R and D team or the business development team or, you know, our HR team for improving our employee experience. So our customers, you know, it's external and internal. What's it, what's interesting about these two, and I, I was glad Sarah went first, was that I was surprised that it was such a big increase in importance and not a no change, because um, I would think those two would have always been like top of mind, very important. Um, so I was surprised to actually see how big of an increase in importance they took, if that makes sense from a statistics standpoint. Um, the DNI one, I wasn't surprised by because I think that's been really top of mind for a lot of people and, and something we're addressing more aggressively than we ever have before. But yeah, no, I think of the customer um, also as the internal and certainly these are things that um, I've, are incredibly important. I mean, there's nothing more important than, you know, customer excellence um, and, and customer success. So the, these are critical for sure. Uh, so I wanted Sarah, John, if you don't mind, if I can Please. quickly add for, for us uh, where uh, we had to shift our focus was again, we do have uh, internal and external customers, but with COVID for instance, external cu customers were looking for contactless engagement. It became imperative. If we right. didn't offer that solution, they were not going to stop at our store. So uh, we again had to take that into consideration as we were moving forward with our innovative ideas. Great. So I, we also asked, is the CIO role expanding into any of the following areas? And this is a, a segment, a, li a shorter list of the ones that we asked about. But the number one area where the CIO role is expanding, and virtually every CIO says their role is expanding beyond traditional IT responsibilities. The number one area is, um, no surprise to me, with cybersecurity. I had always hoped, I always think there should be that very strong 
connection uh, and linkage between those two areas, data analysis, data privacy and compliance, customer experience, which we've talked about. Nathan, anything on this list that surprises you or anything here that you know, you've know you already been doing and expect no, more? Folks? Yeah, yeah, I think those top two two are, it's good to see those at the top. Um, you know, this I have I have a CISO. Um, she she's Alicia. She's great. She reports into the into myself. And then I also this year stood up a chief data officer role. Um, it didn't have anything to do with COVID. We were already headed down that path, given the importance of data analysis and really improving our business intelligence. Um, and so both of those roles are in the CIO organization. And I, I mean, we are so tied at the hip. And, you know, when I have my office of the CIO meet, you know, it's the three of us plus, you know, the, our, our um, software engineer, our infrastructure and our customer experience um, leader, you know, the six of us are together. And I just think it, it's a very powerful team and we're able to get a lot done and react quickly, but also put our roadmaps together and be very proactive. So I, I find it to be fantastic. I would I'd be really bummed if if it was not that way. So um, I would encourage all CIOs to, to get those teams closer if they're not today. Sarah, did you want to weigh in on that? Yeah, it just surprises me that 96% of CIOs thought that it was expanding. For me, it, w- it has always been a part of my role, uh, you know, whether it's talking about data or talking about cybersecurity. So that was the only thing mm. that kind of surprised me a bit. Uh, this, these are the two areas that should always be the focus of CIO because honestly, from data, you're creating value for the organization and optimizing it. Makes sense. CI and CIO, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. No, I agree. So we also asked in your current role is the creation of new revenue generating initiatives among your job responsibilities. And this broke down into three different answers. Nearly 70% say yes, that, you know, the creation of new revenue generating initiatives is among their. Tim, I, I think, think on uh, froze. At least he froze for me. I assume he froze for the audience. I think so. Yeah, I guess so. So uh, I guess we're focusing on revenue generating. Yeah, I can jump in if you want. And then Sarah. Please do. So, I mean, when I when I looked at this, the line of business. Um, well, oh, what do you think about the response? Back. But there you go. John is back. Oh, John is back. John's back. Great. Uh, John, um, I think I don't you know where we slide. lost. You flipped a slide while you were frozen there. I think you were back <laughs> one slide. Great. I uh, know I actually skipped over a slide because of because of time constraints. Oh, good. All right. All right. Good. This. I wanted to ask where you stand in terms of, you know, your role in revenue generating initiatives for the company. Uh, and does this does the data here surprise you? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll say that I am directly involved in that. There are a number of self-service initiatives that we are deploying, which are external consumer facing. Um, so that is um, increasing our capture rate as far as how many uh, you know uh, different customers that we can reach. It's expanding our reach. Um, in addition to that, uh, through the use of technology, we are able to tap into new sources that were previously not available uh, for us. So um, this does not surprise me at all. Uh, and uh, in, in fact, I'm really glad to see that this is the focus of many. Great. Nathan, how about for you? Yeah, no, it's great to hear Sarah's success. I think um, what you're doing is really great at your company. Um, for me, I'm really in that second bar where I'm teamed up. I wouldn't say I don't own PL, um, but, you know, again, working MA, working with our CTO, um, you know, working on different, uh, supporting our manufacturing program or supply chain, or we have a lot of, um, you know, uh, secure work. Our team is very focused on that and helping with um, getting those programs stood up and then supporting them and, and, and working directly with the customer uh, where we generate revenue. But we're certainly teaming uh, with the, the programs, um, not, not leading per se. So, um, so I think it's exciting you know, what Sarah's doing in her organization. I mean, just quickly, any advice for the, for the 32% who say that their team is not tasked with creating and that means they're not involved, they're not leading? advice for them? Uh, That seems a lot to me at this point in the evolution of the role. Yeah, I mean, my advice would be just get close to the business. I mean, in fact, I forget where I was uh, reading an article where it said CIOs are now coming from the business side of the house, more so from a technology uh, tier, 
Yeah. Uh, that that in itself tells us that the need for CIOs to really understand the business side of the side of the house is imperative. I mean, how can you transform? How can you generate more value if you don't understand? And it's a journey. I mean, the, the more that you start engaging with the business, the more trust is developed and more they start relying on you. So there's a shift in culture uh, and, and it can only begin with better partnership and improving, you know, and steering committees are a great way. Spending time in the business Business, which is which is uh, something that uh, I like to do, you know, post COVID as well. Educating your teams uh, to spend time with the business, really being on the front line, are some of the ways through which you can see where are the pain points and then come up with solutions um, to help resolve those. Thank you. Yeah, the, the job rotation is a great thought. You know, whether it's yourself or people on your team that you rotate in from outside the business. Um, will give you more, you know, diversity of thought um, across the business. I personally came out of finance and, and shared service operations, and that was my background before I got to IT. So I came with a very different lens than my IT team. Um, and I think that's a great idea. I think also, you know, um, if your organization has a CTO that's not in your team, but it's it's part of the company, or you, you do have M&A, so you have someone who's focused on, you know, uh, strategic um, acquisitions or mergers, making sure you're close to them and understand what they're doing. Um, and then also trying to get on the calendar of if you have, you know, um, bit lines of business presidents or vice presidents or whatever they may be called um, to just, just have that conversation to ask them about the strategy because things will come up that you could be like, yeah, I can help you with that. Um, I think those are really important ways. And then as Sarah mentioned, once you get more involved, getting that steering committee going um, and really, partnering on the roadmap um, and owning it together, um, I think starts to, to get into those upper two. Great, thanks, Nathan. So one of the things that I love about this survey, there's 1,062 respondents and 250 of them are line of business. That gives us the opportunity to kind of compare how CIOs view themselves versus what's on the mind of line of business folks. And if you have a chance to look at the full survey, you're gonna see a, a number of things, uh, everything from what they what the CEO is expecting from the technology department right now that what's the line of business view on that what do they think the CEO wants as well as what does the CIO think that the CEO wants and there's some real differences there but here we asked CIOs themselves about their level of agreement with these statements 92 percent say the role is becoming more digital innovation focused 89 percent more involved in leading digital transformation initiatives compared to business counterparts. 81% say they've implemented a new technology to enable better customer experiences and interactions. But here we ask the line of business respondents, the 250 non-CIOs, how they view the CIO role. And it breaks down into these kind of personality types or role types. 28% view them as a strategic advisor that proactively identifies business needs, opportunities, makes recommendations. 25% view them as a consultant evaluating and advising on business need, technology choices, risk assessor, cautious voice of reason, autonomous players primarily doing their own thing. This to me seems like a real mismatch in the views between how CIOs view the role and how line of business is viewing the CIO. So Nathan, yeah. what's I agree. What, what strikes you about this and why do you think there's that differentiation? I, I, I don't know. You know, I, my thought is I'm going to take this back, take the percentages off, and I'm going to go to my executive leadership team and ask them. Because I'm, I mean, if I'm not in that strategic advisor box, I'd be kind of bummed out. So, I mean, I'm sure I share in all of all, all five of those to a certain degree, right? There's a part of me that probably fits them all, but that would be the one that I would consider. So, the fact that there's such a high percentage of line of business that didn't pick that, um, and I, I, I mean, I don't know, Sarah, if you feel the same way, but I got to imagine a lot of the CIOs on this call feel. I hope they would pick me there. <laughs> so right. I, I, I'm going to go back and ask. Like, I'm, I'm very transparent with my team. I will absolutely go back and ask. I'm kind of curious. Sarah, do you, do you see this as a communication issue that, that perhaps that CIO isn't communicating as effectively as possible, just what they are involved with and what they are driving forward in the organization? Look, I, I think our CIO role is still seen as a technical call them and I have a technical issue. The, the business continues to see us that way. And it's going to be a while before there is a shift in perception. In addition to that, at least in my organization, there are center of excellence, for instance, that are being created, which are outside of IT. Everything that's happening 
in the center of excellence is driven by technology, but the business sees that as a separate entity. Therefore, they might yeah. not be connecting the dots and be not seeing that, you know, these are the changes that are happening driven by CIO. I still think that CIOs are being seen as just their boundaries are technology solution providers, mm. not necessarily strategic. And it's just, um, you know, we need to work on communication. We need to uh, improve. And again, going back to my previous comment, the more that we are embedded in the business, the more they start leaning on us um, to drive solutions, the more they're going to shift their focus and see as strategic players rather than just as solution providers. I, I think it sounds like you need a high-priced internal consultant, and I'd be happy to fill that role. <laughs> Marketing <laughs> campaign, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I'm going to skip over a couple slides because I really want to make sure we have time to talk about this issue. It's been a big issue. Uh, in, uh, in American society this year, not just this year, but really heightened this year, this issue of diversity, diversity and inclusion. We asked uh, CIOs to respond whether they their level of agreement. Uh, and this is the, the group that would have said agree, I'm sorry, agree somewhat or strongly agree. And that's on a range of don't agree, agree slightly. But these are the folks who say strongly agree or agree somewhat. 77% our team includes a mix of genders. That's remarkable to me that there's 23% of teams that don't have a mix of genders mm -hmm. at this point. 77% our organization understands that our innovation capability increases if diversity and inclusion is a, is a strength of our team. 73% our team includes a mix of ethnic and racial groups. 72% nearly three quarters were making DNI a priority during the hiring process. Great news there. And our current team of less than 60% uh, includes people of varying physical abilities. I'd ask you both, I'll start with you, Sarah. What strikes you from this slide? And then talk a little bit about what, what, what's happening in your organization around diversity and inclusion. Before we go there, John, can I add some context to this discussion just to if people don't do understand? Something. There is a problem here. So a, a survey, a women in technology survey done by IDC, 86% of the people who responded to that survey said that a lack of diversity within an organization will have a definite impact on an organization's culture and its revenue. Yet if you look at some of the statistics that 16% of managers in the information technology industry um, are, are women and, and the rest is, are not. So there's, there's a disparity there and McKinsey uh, was quoted as saying, and this is a quote from McKinsey, women are at a high risk of leaving the workplace due to the, co the challenges of COVID-19. The impact of this loss, particularly the loss of women leaders, could be devastating to companies. So this is just not a discussion. This is an imperative. Yeah. Yeah, Sarah, I, mean, I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. But the thing is, in spite of our like best effort, we are just not finding that talent. I mean, I, I think, John, in our previous conversations, I was talking about we have to go back to the root of it. If you look at um, STEM education and look at how many really females are entering into these fields, I mean, looking at, at how we how important technology has become in our lives, yet you're not seeing as many females enter into the field. So we need to start some of our uh, programs from there to really attract some of the, you know, diverse groups to enter into these fields and then support them through the journey. I mean, we are, we are actively trying to bring in diversity, but unfortunately, just the pool isn't there. Uh, now with, you know, the evolution of workforce and really having more acceptable standard of remote, remote uh, employees all over, one would think that this would increase our zone. It would allow us some options um, to hire from regions that uh, otherwise we wouldn't have. I mean, the problem for us is that the pool just isn't there. Right. And did I, did I understand, Sarah, do you think that there's the possibility that because we're more comfortable with remote work, that it might actually open up that pool to some extent? It might, it might. And that's what my hope is. I mean, it, you continue, I continue to look at, you know, who are the female leaders that are entering into the market and very few CIOs. I mean, how do we explain that? And then you start working backwards and you see that it's, it's a problem at every level, um, all the way back to, you know, where the education is um, being pursued by these diverse groups. Makes sense. Nathan, what's your take on this? And then maybe you could share a little bit about what you're working on when it comes to diversity and inclusion. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think you, you absolutely have to lean in um, and you have, you can't just be on the sideline. I, I've said this before over the last year, you've got to get in the game. You've got to play hard. You've got to figure this out. And as IT, you know, it's, it's hiring the right people, but it's also looking, you know, it's people, 
systems and processes. It's also looking at our systems and processes, right? And make sure there's no biases built into them. Some of them have been around for, you know, decades, like are, relook at them, you know, are they right? Um, you know, I think, you know, we're doing a lot of things. Um, I'm trying to do a lot of things within IT to really, to broaden our horizon, uh, looking at interns, um, you know, we're involved um, so early on, making sure that we have a strong internship program. We're also looking at an apprentice program um, that, that attracts uh, diversity. Um, and I think, you know, SAIC has, has really leaned in on this area, specifically with women in the workforce. And we are a technology company and we're a government contractor. You know, we have a woman C CEO, half our board is female. I mean, we have really leaned in there. And I think, you know, we, we were, I think we've been so, you know, somewhat successful um, on that front, but we also need to um, lean in, you know, um, uh, with other communities, uh, uh, diverse communities too, um, and we can do better there. And it, it's a hard, hard problem. And I agree with you, Sarah, it starts very, I have a, you know, nine-year-old daughter and I keep like, you know, hoping she's going to go, you know, science and STEM and, you know, and she really loves it and that's great, but I, it's got to start really early on. And I think that's a cultural shift um, for all of us as IT leaders, but as parents as well. So we are coming close to our time and I just wanted to take a little bit. We were talking about the difficulty from a, from a, a diversity and inclusion perspective. This is really more overall where CIOs are, are having difficulty finding appropriate skill sets with security leading the list of things that are difficult to fill. AI, machine learning are a newer area than security, uh, data science and analytics. Does this match with where you're having challenges in terms of hiring and bringing talent into your organizations? SAIC is, a, is an, again, an IT company and we have 25,000 employees. We have over 500 open recs right now in all these areas. I think it's crazy. You know, cybersecurity is, is negative unemployment, right? I heard that at uh, an MIT conference a couple months yeah. ago. Um, it, it is very, very tough. And, you know, we try to, you know, you can fight over pay but and benefits, but really, you know, we, we try to attract people based on our mission, um, you know, what we're trying to do. And I think each company has a unique mission. And, and that's really where you attract the right talent is someone who's really passionate about what your company's purpose is. Um, and that's what we're, you know, we try to focus on that to differentiate ourselves when we're trying to hire new hires. But to Sarah's point, hopefully with the world kind of opening up, you know, or the, at least for us, it's more U.S. based, but um, being able to hire across the country because we can hire people in some cases yeah. um, that can work at home. It should open up a little bit. Sarah, I don't know what your experience is. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I absolutely agree with you, Nathan, that you know, it definitely reflects the priority and, and the difficulty in each of these roles. The thing that I noted the most about uh, cybersecurity is that even though we put in a lot of effort and we even hire like junior people who may not have all of that talent, we invest in training them. And then the minute that they are a little bit more mature, six months, eight months, a year into it, and then they're gone. Because the turnover, the, the pay scale is like so high, the talent shortage is so high uh, that the, the attrition in this area makes this issue even bigger for us. Um, so doesn't surprise me at all. Uh, I, I wish we could do something with it. Now, the, the one of the strategy that we have adapted um, is started uh, attracting our internal resources, train them and, and kind of give them diverse um, pathways so that they can learn and hopefully continue to stay. Great. Well, I'm going to turn this back over to Tim, but before I do, just a couple of things. One, uh, a reminder that this is really a slice of the overall survey. There's a lot more data in there about all of these. I skipped over a, a slide that really talked about some of the technology priorities, uh, according to CIOs, for the coming year. But I think we covered a lot of ground, and Sarah and Nathan, I'm really grateful for your insights and your candor about what you're working with, what you're wrestling with. I want to thank you. Tim, I want to thank you and the CEC for the opportunity to do this. It's been a real pleasure to go through these results and learn so much from our guests today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate yeah. the opportunity. Thank you for having right. us. Thank you, John. Yeah, we are at the top of the hour and out of time. So I would also like to express my thanks to Sarah and Nathan for joining us today. I'd also like to thank uh, you, John. Thank you for moderating and walking us through the slides and steering this discussion. I'd also like to thank IDC Research for producing these great state of the CIO surveys each year and the IDG virtual production team for creating and managing today's pre presentation as well. And as John said, as a reminder, you can view more results from the survey as well as read an executive summary of the research by going on CIO.com 
Today's presentation will also be available on CIO.com website, as well as their YouTube channel. For the CIO Executive Council, I'm Tim Scannell. Stay safe and see you next time.